Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Windows Wednesday. My name is Kale Cinnamon. I'm the program manager for Windows Terminal and also working on the Windows developer experience. I'm joined today by Scott Hanselman and also Mark Rusinovich, who is the CTO of Azure and also creator of System Turtles. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so System Turtles just turned 25. That's huge. Um, I'd love to talk about what's coming for System Turtles, some questions we have about it, uh, maybe walk through Hanselman's setup of, or Scott's setup of uh, how he likes to use the tools and uh, just kind of get into it. Yeah, happy to take this wherever direction you want. Lots to talk about. Awesome. I'd like to know what the first one was. Like you were sitting around uh, and you're in 1996 and you were other people involved and what was the first tool? When were you like, you know, let's see if we can break windows by writing some code. <laughs> well, the first tool actually is a, a, a keyboard filter driver called Control to Cap, which is still available on Sys Internals today. I, I grew up on Unix uh, going through college and grad school. And uh, on Unix keyboards, the control key is where the caps lock key is on PC keyboards. And so I had muscle memory for control being there. And uh, when I started working on PCs, I found that very awkward. And so uh, looked to see how I could fix that. And at the time, there weren't the keyboard maps that are there today uh, in Win32 user, at least not that I could find. So I wrote a keyboard filter driver that would intercept keystrokes and swap them um, for that. And uh, still swap, the, swap them today. So I'm looking at control to cap right now because I have a folder, as everyone does, called sys internals that I added to my path. So I have them available at all times. And control uh, to cap is right there. How many did you have before you called it a suite? Um, well, the so we created a few tools. Me and Bryce Cogswell, uh, who I met in grad school, started writing these tools. I, I wrote uh, Control Account myself, but we all then created like the the real first NT internals tool of any utility for the, for more than just people that uh, came from Unix keyboards, and that was called NTFS DOS which was an NTFS file system driver for DOS. You could run oh. NTFS DOS and then mm. see your NTF files on NTFS. That kind of was the bridge to us uh, starting Winternals, which was built on initial uh, utilities to recover dead Windows NT systems. And on the dead NT system, you couldn't uh, fix the file system or recover files off it if you couldn't boot it. And so NTFS DOS would let you recover files off it. And then we created another tool called NT Recover, which would create a virtual disk from a running NT system, connected it through a serial cable to a DOS, basically a virtual block driver to let you mount remote disks over the serial cable. And then you could read, write, fix them and run, you know, load registry hives into regedit and things like that. Um, the other NT internals tools uh, that we created initially were included FileMon and RegMon, which, you know, as I started uh, exploring uh, Windows internals, not just NT, but also Windows 95, looking to see what was going on under the hood of file system and registry calls, which are the main calls for state, for state stores on Windows, uh, wrote versions for NT and for Windows 95. And then we decided, uh, so I was publishing these tools through a friend named Andrew Shulman, who wrote this book called Undocumented or uh, Undocumented Windows 95. I don't know if you remember that book, Scott. Yeah. But uh, he, um, or Unauthorized Windows 95, that's what it was called. Um, so I published the tools on his site, but uh, after a while, I'd be like, hey, update to file mine. Andrew, can you publish it? And it'd be a week before he'd respond. And so I said, mm -hmm. Bryce, let's go start our own website. So September 1996, we created ntinternals.com and uh, started uh, publishing the tools there. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so when you started making these tools, they were just for, just for fun, just wanting to get into like the code base of OS's and Windows and then decided that more people will like the tools or how did you go from just making them for fun to making a whole suite? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just I kind of just made them for fun and to, for learning. I mean, I found that I love doing things that have multiple outputs, uh, useful outputs. Like in the process of writing the tool, I'd learn about Windows internals. The tool itself would show me about Windows internals. Other mm -hmm. people find the tools useful. 
And then in some cases we could sell derivatives or, or versions of the tools for profit. So it had all these great benefits developing the tools. How many other people at the time were also poking around and how much of it was you just read the documentation better than everyone else versus you're like, hang on, that header file doesn't line up. There's a function there that no one else sees. Um, I think there were quite a few people poking around, but I don't know if any were kind of looking at it in the same, with the same lens that I was, because when, um, what I would do is uh, I wrote a cost, uh, my own disassembler um, that would take symbol files and map the public symbols into the disassembly so I could look at functions and reverse engineer them. I would also look at the header files to look at structures and references to structures. I'd look at the symbols to look to references to functions that might look interesting. And if they were interesting, reverse engineer them to understand how to call them. And uh, was always looking towards what kind of internal information is there that I could surface in a tool that would be kind of cool to look at. Just more cool to look at than uh, anything necessarily useful. So file on a Regmon were like cool stuff to look at. It turns out that they were really useful for troubleshooting as well, but it was, they, uh, all of that came out of that. Info. One of the examples was uh, finding an entry query system information call, which is one of the entry points to getting a lot of internal information about the NT kernel that would let you get a list of the open handles on the system. And mm -hmm. so I was like, that is a cool call because I can see all the files that are open, like LSOF on uh, Unix systems. And so I figured reverse engineered it and wrote a tool called Handle, which is still there today, which lets you see what open files there are on the system. Which is one of the most like asked questions, that whole like, who's got that open? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I noticed that when we look at these, we this this happened a couple, you know, several years ago, but I always remember like the name of the file, handle.exe, and then little buddies started hanging out next to them, a 64 version and then some 64A versions. I'm curious why you chose that architecture and how does that work there? Yeah, so the um, I kind of was frustrated when I started creating the tools. Um, the fact that like I had a, a Regmon for Windows 95 and a Regmon for Windows NT and they initially were a regmon.exe and a regmon.vxd for Windows 95 or regmon.sys or regsys.sys for NT. So you'd have to copy these files, know which ones to copy and, and then launch them, the user mode component and the kernel component for the right version. I decided, so, and, and the GUIs were pretty much the same. So I unified the GUIs for the tools. So they would just be one, but then I still had the driver problem. Um, and I wanted these files just to be like, you know, copy a single file. There was no concept of what an Apple uh, operating system is called a fat binary, where you can have multiple binaries, multiple images inside the same package and just launch it and the right one would launch. So I created my own fat binary system of by embedding files into the resources section of the Win32 ma main payload. And that way I could have a, a primary regmon.exe, for example, that had two drivers and embedded into it and it would run say, oh, I'm on an NT system. Let me extract the NT driver and then load it or uh, on Windows 95, load the Windows 95 driver. Now, over time, I ended up having um, all the tools in this fat binary mode. But what happened was um, back in, I think it was Windows Vista time frame, we had 64 bit only versions of Windows with no Win32 subsystem. And that meant a Win32 main drive, main executable couldn't run. And by that time I'd had like the Win32 process monitor say, oh, I want a 64-bit system. Let me launch, let me extract the 64-bit Procmon XE, which would then extract the 64-bit driver. Or if I'm on a 32-bit system, it would extract this 32-bit driver directly and launch it. The um, 60, the lack of Win32 meant that people couldn't run the tools at all. They would just say it's Win32 subsystem not present. So that's what led to the separating out and saying, if you run a 64-bit only system, download the 64-bit version of the file. Now the, the drivers are still embedded there. So Procmon 64 has the Procmon 64 driver embedded into it, but it'll work on a 64-bit only system with a no Win32 subsystem. And then you, I think you, you mentioned that you saw ones with an A suffix uh, like a64 right and that's for arm 64 versions of windows 
that have no Win32, no x86 Win32 subsystem. So you can directly go on an ARM system and launch those. But now this, the tools, uh, the Win32 tools have the ARM binaries in, embedded in them, the 32-bit and 64-bit binaries embedded in them as well. Yeah. How important do you think that we should, should we have made fat binaries before? I mean, that was, yeah, that was I, the thing. I just was baffled one. I was like, it's eventually going to happen. Just, yeah. just, but it never did. Never did. Now I notice here that test TCP view is in dark mode, but process Explorer isn't. And if I want to be really pedantic, I can kind of zoom in and I can see, you know, font rendering differences and stuff. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. It looks like you're in some kind of a visual refresh mode because as new versions of sys internals are coming out, I'm seeing refreshed UIs. Yeah, we, um, you know, dark modes have become all the rage over the last few years. And like, you're not a cool developer unless you're running in dark mode. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so we, I decided, hey, I need to have sys internals refreshed um, to give it the more modern look, as opposed to the, the old style icons, refresh them to modern icon styles that are Windows icon styles, and then also refresh them to dark mode. So we created a dark, theme engine for sys internals and have been going through and skinning the tools. Uh, Auto runs is the most recent one that got skinned and process. Uh, you're seeing TCP view process monitor skinned and process Explorer. It has tons of custom drawn controls inside of it. Like mm. this, that tree view, that's a tree list right there. It's a custom control Bryce and I created back in the early or late 1990s. Um, so we've been working on theming, the controls inside a process explorer and shortly we're it's we're t still testing it there's still a few bugs in dark mode on it but uh we hope to this month be releasing process explorer a refresh of it with new icons and dark mode and some new process information and a threads view at the bottom so a uh, big major release for process explorer coming that's going to be huge a threads view at the bottom makes a lot of sense we've got dlls and handles already and having even more information as opposed to going to properties and seeing yeah. your threads. And that'll be a tab on, view on the bottom. So you'll have DLLs, file uh, handles and threads. Yeah. So when I'm doing uh, presentations and I know Kayla has the same thing, we'll end up using, um, using zoom it. And, you know, I've, got, I've become quite good at it to the point where the, the, the muscle memory is there. I can kind of do whatever. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a kata that's available to me at all times in my, in my brain. Mm -hmm. And then people will say, oh, my goodness, how are you drawing on the screen there? And I have to admit, Mark, I don't want to tell them sometimes. I just want to say it's something <laughs> special and private that only I can do. But uh, people are still learning about Zoom it every single day. Is that the most glamorous of the tools? Uh, I, it's one of my favorite. It's the tool that I use the most, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm often using it live Zoom to zoom in on tiny fonts on my screens on a daily basis. Um, yeah. And I think... It came um, that the origins of that tool is that I was teaching Windows internals classes with Dave Solomon, the co-author on the Windows internals book. And um, we'd be presenting in front of the class and, and people couldn't see the, the tools and the demos. And so we found this um, magnification utility that came with Toshiba laptops. And uh, we're using that, but it was really awkward. Like you had to use this funky key control sequence to zoom and uh, it was just a pain in the rear and it would, was kind of buggy. And so I'm like, after a while, I'm just going to write my own. So I wrote my own Zoom tool and do, uh, there's a break timer built into it, which is specifically we've created for the class. In fact, Dave Solomon's got a funny story because uh, you can count down and actually it'll go negative. And he yeah. didn't know that. And so he'd go out <laughs> for a break, setting it for 10 minutes and he'd come back and be like negative four. <laughs> and uh, he'd be embarrassed that he showed up late for the, you know, come back and continue the class after the break. Got that a, that's a thing actually worth pointing out culturally, Mark, that during the nineties, there was a time when you would, you would go to a local place with a, with 20 laptops or 20 desktops rather, you know, and I would do these like a Don box or Chris sells or somebody and you'd sit down at John Robbins and we would use this. We'd use live zooms. So, okay, buddy, we're gonna take a break and we're going to go for a walk and come back in 10 minutes. You put this up on the screen and we would all sit there like a classroom and uh, you don't see that as much anymore, yeah. but it was a very special yeah, time. fun time. It was fun. I had so much fun giving the te uh, teaching those classes and interacting with the people in the room. There's a ton of things that zoom. It does that people don't realize that's worth pointing out. Everyone goes, all right, control one zoom and you draw or you arrow or you square. But 
you can make the screen white, you can make the screen black, you can start typing on the screen. Nobody does that. No one does that enough, you know, being able to type on the yeah. screen. How often are people discovering things about sys internals you didn't really, I thought everyone knew that this was a thing and you know, here we are in 2022 and everyone's like, what? You can type on the screen? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have that much interaction with people using the tools, so I don't know what people are finding uh, with the tools and, oh. and not discovering. And there's no instrumentation. This is another, you know, uh, question that I've gotten a lot is, or when people come and uh, are looking at, hey, how can we make the tools more useful? Hey, is it, do we know how many people are using the tools? Do we know what they're using when they use the tools? And I'm like, no. And that's actually been a goal is no calling home for any of these tools, mm. Um, mm. no telemetry of any kind. Always been, it's it's clean. You know what you see is what you get. You get the binary. You install it. It tries to not leave anything behind. Which you, if you delete it, and it's not calling back home with any kind of information. So useful in any kind of environment, regardless of what kind of privacy concerns you got. Just upgraded this week to 5.0. Appreciate that. I did notice that there was a couple of you know in the documentation here, which is inside of the tabs there's a, a pretty clear warning that on Windows Vista, there's some screen flickering. So I'm glad that oh, even with yeah. version 5.0, which came out yesterday, there's still that warning that you can use this on Vista, be aware that there's some problems. <laughs> yeah. Time, time to delete that. Thanks for uh, calling that out. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I think it's kind of charming, actually. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious, though, how many times do like things break? Are you like, oh, I called that thing and I can't do that anymore? Or like, how much of the real code here? Like when you have a copyright uh, that is that wide, You've been working on this for that long. Is this a rewrite or is this 90% of what you wrote the first time? It's it's 90%. Uh, in fact, um, one of the you know aspects of the tools and the source code in the tools. Well, first, to answer your question about how much just continues to work, Windows is fantastic in general about app compact. And so most of the tools continue to work, despite the fact that they're even using undocumented APIs in some cases, they still continue to work because the premise is even if it's undocumented, somebody might be using it, including internally, you know, tools at Microsoft. So it's very hard to break, to change something without being risking breaking the world. But um, the, the source code of the tools oftentimes is me spending a few hours here and there adding stuff to them. And so it's the standard software project that never, almost never gets re-architected from scratch, even though its requirements have changed and functionality has grown over many years where you'd say, you'd take a look at it and go, wow, this thing is a total spaghetti mess. Um, how did anybody write something like this? Especially somebody that uh, people think might write good code uh, based off <laughs> how the code behaves. Um, so tools like Process Explorer and, and uh, Zoomit are, like Zoomit, I'm embarrassed to say, is one giant file with all of the functionality in that file. And it's just because I've been incrementally adding to it and just never said, let them go refactor this and pull these things out and they're on separate files or create there. It's not object oriented either because I, I, there's only a few of the tools that are using C plus plus object orientation classes and objects. So it's a uh, vanilla C just lots of spaghetti code. And, uh, but, and, you know, since I wrote it, I can go back and figure out what's going on. And, but it's, I, pity anybody that just tries to figure out how Zimit works under the hood. So kind of bouncing off of that, have you thought about making these tools open source so people can go refactor Zoomit and make it multiple files for you? Um, yeah, I've thought, thought about it. I mean, open sourcing comes with uh, responsibilities and it also comes at a, at a cost. Um, so, you know, first I say is what's, what's the cost benefit for open sourcing a tool? Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it generally hasn't panned out to, okay, I'm going to take the effort to open source them. Even though some of the tools could be open source. Some of the tools cannot be open source because they're using undocumented internal data structures. In fact, it's called Windows Sys internals because they're officially part of Windows and so have access to these kinds of undocumented APIs. Um, so that's really the, the primary reason. One is just laziness and the other one is in some cases I can't. Yeah, that's understandable. I, I know... For sure, like maintaining an open source project is a lot more work than maybe some people yeah. realize. I mean, you're signing up and say, okay, if I want to create a community around this, I need to look at pull requests and I need to share the roadmap for it. I need to educate people about what the philosophy of this thing. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, it comes comes with some overhead. Yeah, definitely. 
So, um, oh, go ahead. No, please, go ahead. You, you first. Oh, okay. Um, so since they're using undocumented APIs and things like that as part of Windows, um, do you have reasoning or ideas or maybe future ideas of maybe the tools being built into Windows by default? Um, so the, re the you know, I, this is a question I got right when I got acquired, uh, me and Bryce got acquired by Microsoft System Internals, came in with Winternals is, hey, oh, now the tools are gonna be built into Windows. And I never thought that would be a good idea. In fact, mm. you see lots of tools like this that used to be built into Windows, pulling out of Windows and becoming add-ons. And the reason is agility. I didn't want to be, you know, refreshing the Windows, the system internals tools every three years. Plus, going inbox um, brings a lot of, of commitment to Windows inbox standards that I didn't want the tools to be encumbered with. The whole goal of the tools is I can spend a few hours on a weekend and release something that is, that is useful. But if you go in the, in the box, basically you're signing up for like uh, localization. Uh, which mm -hmm. is you need to localize it to all the languages that Windows supports. You need to sign up to the rigorous security standards of Windows and compliance standards of Windows and build standards of Windows. And so, um, and all of that stuff is fantastic. And that's why people consider Windows such a reliable, you know, solid uh, system for development and for enterprise use. But the tools has always been what, you know, it's freeware, it's, use at your own risk. You know, if you find it useful, use it. If you don't, don't. Um, but so with, with that philosophy, it's just try to keep the whole process of developing the tools and making them available and updating them really as lightweight as possible. To, to that point, one of the things that is that System Terminals has always been known for is its easy availability. And by that, I don't mean you can just go and download the thing. If you go to live.sysinternals.com in a browser, you will see uh, a standard directory listing the way we used to see in the mosaic days. This is kind of like, hey, here's the files. They're right there. But even more, and this has been like this for, for since ever, forever, if you go to backslash backslash or what we would say in the old days, whack whack live.sysinternals.com slash tools, it, there's an open file share on the open internet, Mark. Yeah. We should call someone and have that security thing shut down there. That's been there for 20 plus years. Why did you decide to do that? And why is that so powerful? Uh, so I just, so we, um, you know, we hosted the system internal site on IIS, the web server, and I found WebDAV, this feature in it called WebDAV, which is you could publish a, a file share on through IIS and said, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we just put the tools on the file share and then people could run them directly and so uh, thus was the born live.sysinternals.com. And I, I just thought it was, it's just cool to do. I don't know if, if people find it useful, that's great, but it's just cool to be able to just launch something directly off the web like that. Yeah, it's super cool to do. Being able to do that on a machine that you're at a client's office and you just go and hit that URL or hit it in the browser or hit it in Explorer and you can run it read only directly off of that share. So sysinternals tools are always available no matter where, no matter where you are. Another thing that's worth pointing out that Kayla and I are very excited about, here's my, my, uh, my uh, prompt. Mm -hmm. Let's go to a, a non-controversial folder here. I can go and say win get install sys internals now, and it's going to spin for a second and then say yes, and then now it's going to go and grab sys internals, and you've got, boom, now I've got it everywhere in one line, win get install sys internals, and I get all of them. It says this suite includes all the tools and now I don't have to put them in the path because it uses execution aliases. So being able to do that was uh, was pretty exciting as well. Thank you for for yeah, having your I, team um, think that that was important. That actually comes directly as a side effect of going into the Microsoft Store. So mm -hmm. if you're in the Microsoft Store, you're accessible through WinGet as well. And uh, we we went into the Microsoft Store, so you can go to the Microsoft Store and install them that way too, and then get them in your Start menu. Um, get shortcuts to them as well. Yep. I just got a notification that says Sys Internal Suite just got installed. Check it out. Pin to start. And then pops up the browser right there. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I just downloaded all of them from the store. So it was awesome to see them in the start menu because I downloaded them from the doc site that Scott was just showing. And I wasn't sure how best to get to them. So I really do like the, the start menu integration. Um, so let's say 
this is the first time someone's heard of cis internals in this video. What do you think is the first tool that um, developers should try? I think if you're a developer, uh, for, I mean, the most useful developer tool, I think, is Process Monitor. And uh, I used to do these Case of the Unexplained talks at Tech Eds and Ignites and Builds the, to show troubleshooting. And a lot of those were enterprise desktop troubleshooting problems, but some were developer troubleshooting problems. The, and several tools help with troubleshooting, but Process Monitor by far the number of cases that I've collected where I think people have sent me log files and screenshots and stories about how they fixed some problem or diagnosed some problem. I've got hundreds of them and uh, process monitor based. So it just shows you what's going on underneath the hood with file system registry, thread, network activity. Um, it also has CPU profiling uh, as an option too. Um, and it has summary stats. Um, you can has rich filtering capabilities built into it. So it, it can take this, like, why am I, why is my app throwing a bizarre error dialog to finding exactly what API call resulted in what error message that got, you know, caught as some exception in your app that is throwing a weird error dialog. I think the part that's most interesting and powerful about process monitor that I don't think people realize is that if I understand correctly, there are tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of potential things that you you could be looking at and you're being smart, not only about filtering, but you've got this virtualization where they're all coming into some central pile of this queue. And then you, you say how many messages are happening. You're seeing 3% of what's really going on. You do some kind of a sampling there. So you overwhelm the user, but you don't overwhelm the user. Yeah. So if you go to filter uh, up there. Oops. This is a screenshot. Oh. I just up and Actually, I just upgraded my process monitor, so I have to reboot to get the filter driver to install, but I will go ahead and uh, okay. see. So yeah, I just okay. because I just upgraded literally before the show, I need to sure. get the new driver uh, here. You should still be able yeah, to see this. Yeah. To if, you to, if you go to uh, actually go back to the filter dialog, um, see that enable advanced output? That mm. now go back to the filter dialog that you'd opened, and you'll see that the list at the bottom is much shorter. Um, and that's because oh. what's happening is uh, process monitors uh, has a basic mode where it's got a whole bunch of filters for things that most, when you're troubleshooting, most problems aren't really that interesting. Mm. Um, so you go back and disable advanced mode and take a look at the filters that are, that show back up. There you can see it'll filter out activity from itself. It'll filter out NTFS metadata file system activity, page file activity activity from the system process, because normally you're not troubleshooting system issues, you're troubleshooting some app issue. So those uh, is a lot, that, that delta is what you're seeing, is anything that's been filtered out is going to show up as uh, yeah. the you non-100%. Know, this is so important for people to know. You can see here that I was debugging uh, a PowerShell thing because it's like, I feel like a script is writing to a file and you, you have to, we have to remind ourselves, Kayla and I have talked about this offline, the idea that your computer's not a black box. If you don't know what's going on, ask it. And, and you know, things like process monitor let you ask it. I think someone's writing that file or I think that process is doing something weird. Show me everything it's doing. Yeah. And you can, there's nothing hidden from you. So one of the, for, for understanding what a process or app is doing to a system, one of the most useful filters if you go up is category is right. If you say category is right, then that it just records modifications, registry modifications and file system modifications. So if you're saying, what is my PowerShell writing? You know, what mm. file is it writing? That will zoom in on just the things that it's modifying. I did not know that. That is fantastic. I've already, this is already been hugely valuable yeah. to learn that one tip has been like, that's the tip. I'm going to use that tip all day. So one of the uh, places where, you know, there's lots of ways to learn about using the tools. Like I mentioned, case of the unexplained video. So if you go to YouTube, Mark Rosinovich, um, I've got the case of the unexplained videos published there. Um, I'm far away from Scott, your follower, uh, your subscriber counts on my YouTube channel, but uh, hopefully I'm hoping 
this, my appearance here will boost me up into the 100,000 range. It's going to happen for you today. You're going to be <laughs> over me by the end of the show. Okay. <laughs> um, but you can see that there's a, a malware hunting with the system internals tools. There's cases that explained uh, sessions as well. So those are great ways to learn how to use the tools just through examples of that, are, like I said, are collections of mine and other people's own experiences using the tools to troll, to solve problems. But uh, I also highly recommend Troubleshooting with the Windows System Internals Tools, a book that I co-authored with Aaron Margosis. Uh, Aaron um, used to work at Microsoft Networks at a, a security company and uh, would oftentimes teach Windows uh, System Internals Tools at conferences. So we co-authored this book which uh, has chapters on all the major tools. So it'll have the tip there about like, like you just discovered about how to use uh, the right filter and process monitor. Um, oh. It's got a section on using ZoomIt and all the things you can do with ZoomIt as well. So this is uh, a really great resource if, you're, if you wanna really get the most out of the tools. Um, and if you're not just a casual, I'll, I'll use them every now and then. And, um, but really wanted to learn what the, you can do with them deeply. This is the book to get. Very cool. So folks can check out Mark and blow him right past 100,000 on YouTube. Uh, they can check out the book on uh, everywhere books are sold. Um, and, and Windows Wednesday today, Kayla, how cool is that? Yeah, this has been really awesome. Uh, definitely will go check out that book and give it a read. Um, so I know we're at time. Um, I'd like to thank you, Mark, for coming on. This has been super helpful. Um, and just really informational about how to use these tools and the things that are available for sys internals and what's coming. Um, so it's really exciting to see. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a fun, fun chat um, and uh, good, fun to look back at the history of the tools and, and, think, and see how uh, you, Scott, are making great use of them already. And, and Kayla, hopefully a new sys internals fan. Oh, absolutely. I've been trying to get Zoom it like as part of my vernacular when doing demoing and just getting the controls like as smooth as Scott. Um, so that's just been a goal that I've been working on because it, it really is an awesome tool. All right, well, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we'll have to have you on again when there's new sys internal updates. So thanks for yeah. watching everyone and thanks for joining us.